and our cohesive creativity as well to leave no one behind and to finally go beyond and, and also overcome it. At the UN Geneva, we have initiatives such as the Perception Change Project and particularly the SDG Lab, which gather collective input and then they communicate around it to help solve current challenges and to advance the common progress towards the sustainable development goals. And so it's commendable and it's as well encouraging for us to see the many partners that the WHO and its Impact for Health initiative have gathered to progress on SDG 3, health and well-being for all. We're really glad that we can contribute to this initiative and that we can provide the support to the event today. Uh, we can present this extremely diverse exhibition, I would say, and uh, we can possibly help with the making of a documentary, which will add sustainability to this initiative as well. And I hope it comes together. So I would like to thank the organizers for bringing this integrative event to UNOC, and especially also Isabel Waxmuth, who, uh, who is at the, at the core of, of organizing this event. And we will now see some of the video messages from the representatives of the organizations. First is going to be speaking Dr. Tedros, Director General of the World Health Organization. Then Mr. Kininger Pasili, the Vice President of the World Academy of Art and Science. And he's also the Director of the Common World Academy and UNOC project, Global Leadership for the 21st Century. And then he will be followed by Ambassador guests, Alfaro, the permanent colleagues representative and friends. of Peru. At so the science-based organization, WHO puts a lot of emphasis on data and evidence. But we must acknowledge that art has the power to inspire and communicate in ways that data and evidence may not. My colleague Isabel Vaxmuth exhibition encourages us to consider how art can open a meaningful dialogue and spark collaboration between health professionals, patients, their families, and communities. To achieve the ambitious targets the world has set us in the Sustainable Development Goals, we must use every tool at our disposal to change behavior and drive impact to spark people's imagination about what is possible and to stimulate people to act in new ways. I thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. The World Academy of Art and Science is very proud to be uh, among the organizers of Art Impact for Health and SDGs. This event is indeed a, the perfect prelude to the conference that the World Academy, under the auspices of the United Nations Director General, will be holding on the 25th of November on the subject of leadership and SDGs. The exact title is Global Leadership for the 21st Century. It's a project that we have started uh, six months before COVID unleashed all the drama that is in front of us today, and that is presenting catalytic strategies to deal with these uh, challenges. Now, art, art, as we know, is the ability to transform material resources at hand through intuition, inspiration, and creativity. It's also the ability to forge means of survival and to elevate their value and consciousness. So by all means, art and its expression are a synonym to the concept of leadership. They require inspiration, art and leadership. They require an ethical approach and they are based on the example, the example of the artist, the example of the leader that has a vision that has a consciousness and that is able also to share his or her examples and to lead by them. The UN is taking an unparalleled effort to promote this sense of shared consciousness and closer cooperation, the solidarity that is so much needed. It is one of the main priority emerging out of the drama of the COVID-19. 
the adoption of the SDGs by 193 nations represents the landmark achievement and really the adoption, the sense of, of, of the universal declaration of human rights into practical commitments. Yet, in spite of all this, in uh, spite of the efforts, there is a global leadership vacuum that grows even wider. Why that? Because there are many entrenched powers, because of vested interests, and because of the temptation to resist change. Nonetheless, multilateral institutions are needed, and, and we have to do everything possible to unobstruct the, the concept of uh, insecurity and self-interest that have been built around it. Uh, the important elements that we have in front of us are all in, in, into the project that we have, uh, we have uh, generated and that deals with the uh, emergence of a more inclusive and effective multilateral system. Out of our projects, we have five interdependent pillars that represent this approach. Redefining multilateralism is one, sustaining peace and human security, mobilizing civil society, financing and implementing SDGs, and transforming global education. We will come up with concrete ideas, suggestions for world leaders on how to do so. But for the time being, let's open the doors to the event, Art Impact for Health and SDGs, that one of our fellows, members, uh, Isabel Vaxmuth, has so well coordinated and animated. We are very proud of that. And we thank you for the vision that you are transmitting as artists, but also as participants, as guests to this event. And we welcome your participation to the future event we are going to hold in this same Palais on the 25th of November, Global Leadership for the 21st Century. Good evening. Madame Director General of the United Nations Office in Geneva, Ms. Tatiana Balovaya. Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me as permanent representative of Peru to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva to be part of this opening event of the Art Impact for Health and SDGs exhibition at the Palais des Nations. We are certainly living extraordinarily complex times around the world due to the disruptive effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, not only in health, but also in the economy and the well-being of our populations. The current COVID-19 pandemic has exposed inequalities and shortcomings all over the world and has shown the challenges that we as international community face in addressing international health emergencies and the crystal clear need for strong multilateral institutions such as the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Nevertheless, the current focus on the response to the pandemic and the need to strengthen global preparedness and response for the future should not make us lose perspective on other important health goals, such as universal health coverage and the promotion of healthier population through integrated people-centered health services. In this context, the Art Impact for Health project offers a great platform integrating art as a people-centered health approach in the healing process of patients. While respecting the emotions, feelings and cultural background of the patients and their families, art constitutes a powerful tool for recovery. Coming back to this exhibition, I am particularly grateful to the Smile Trail Train organization 
and its local partners in Peru, such as Fundación Margarita and Clinica Segarra, for the great work they are carrying out, helping children and their families to overcome cleft lip and cleft palate, offering access to comprehensive cleft care to allow children to be able to achieve their full potential. We are talking about a life-changing medical procedure that will prevent future health conditions and improve the psychological well-being of the children, their families and their communities. The government of Peru has been very active in providing free cleft care for children through a group of medical volunteers encompassing pediatricians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, mental health professionals and nurses to allow children to smile again. Furthermore, our national efforts are greatly complemented by international partners such as Smile Train and their local partners in Peru. And we are very thankful for their continuous support. The various masks that you see today in this art exhibition have been created by patients that have had the opportunity to receive cleft care or are in the process of getting their surgery. A mask that has been traditionally associated with the idea of hiding or in the COVID context with the idea of protection has a different and special meaning in this exhibition since their creative process allowed the patients with the opportunity to express their feelings and insights and look to the future with a renovated attitude. These masks represent the ability to overcome challenges and to be resilient. These masks show the true meaning of a health recovery pathway in which we shall see art as a vehicle to raise awareness, to empower individuals, and to fight stigma and discrimination. While keeping social distancing, I hope we can all enjoy this so meaningful exhibition. Thank you very much. Good evening. The second part of the event online as well, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to that one. And so for this, I would first like to introduce the moderator for this part, who is Isabel Wachsmuth. Her name has been mentioned already several times. She represents the WHO Initiative Act, Art Impact for Health, and she herself is an artist, and she put this exhibition together. Uh, she's not new to our cultural activities program either. She has been here already the third time now that you're here, Isabel. I'm very happy actually to meet her again because I had the pleasure to introduce her before as well at an exhibition that she did about, about uh, violence and resilience from uh, women's perspectives. Also a very powerful exhibition just like this one here. And I would now just like to hand over the floor to Isabel for the moderation of the second part. And thank you all for being here again. Thank you so much, uh, dear guest. It is a big honor for me to to present, in fact, this uh, exhibit. And uh, I will be, uh, my speech will be short, but just to to thank uh, every of you uh, to have co-created uh, this event together. So it, is, it is a story of co-creation between so many different arts and sectors and authentic relationship, like a beautiful melody, to inspire hope, joy, sharing, and harmony. This art exhibit is a way to revisit the SDG through art and specifically through the virtues of well-being and wellness, like the theme of World Wellness Weekend. We have done that with, with Jean-Guy and he's with us uh, tonight. He will be one of our speakers in the panel and I thank him uh, so much to, to come from Paris today. Uh, and and about World Wellness Weekend, uh, it was beautiful as well, team have been expressed artistically, and you can see it here. It is about, you know, uh, the theme of serenity. The serenity lead to peace. It is about vitality to lead to prosperity. 
It is solidarity, harmonious relationship, nutrition, our relationship with the planet, well-being about the people, about us, about human being. And I thanks to all the artists who have contributed to the success of the event and to the art exhibit today. And specifically, a big thanks to Karin Schaub. It is a writer, you know, you can write, you can read, sorry, it is beautiful uh, text, you know, illustrate each uh, um, topic of SDG. Aurélien Romieu, you know, is a photographer. Uh, Grégory Monjon as well is another photographer. You can see, you know, on, on, uh, on the team of prosperity and ear relationship. And uh, as well, our musician, uh, Alan Tibi and Gaëtan Le Bardier, um, and as well, Pierre Pacalé. Unfortunately, Pierre Pacalé will not join us uh, today, uh, but I am sure it will be beautiful closure uh, of this, um, of this inauguration, inauguration with the music. And I would like to thank as well Daniel Schaub for this uh, beautiful painting, specifically to illustrate the topic of nutrition so important. Um, and as well the, the sculptor, uh, the sculptor is with us as well. It is Nello. Thank you so much because you came, you, you come from very far and we are so happy to, to show your uh, beautiful sculpture are amazing and, and this sculpture fit perfectly, in fact, with each topic of SDG we present tonight. And I would like to thank so much United Nations itself uh, is promoting the SDG, you know, through culture, such uh, art exhibition. And thanks as well to the commitment of UNESCO to support this initiative. I thank the University of Peace, uh, amazing uh, partner as well. I have worked uh, with David for, uh, for many uh, years now and thanks David to be with us and he will be as well one of our panelists. Uh, thanks again for this invaluable and constant support to make art and culture a more powerful tool for peace. Uh, and the broad interdependence between environmental and human health is recognized in system thinking and the new focus on planetary health. Thanks to, as well, uh, UNGSII and WHIS. You know, they, they will be as well uh, part of our, our panel de, uh, today. They will be, uh, uh, two of, of, of them are speakers, Roland and Garrett, and I thank them so, so much for their holistic vision and leadership on SDG and to have recognized the importance of art to communicate and engage with people over the world and becoming a key partner for Art Impact for Health and now we extend to SDG. The main, the main goal of Art Impact for Health and SDG initiative, it is a way to raise awareness and possibly changing individual and collective action towards more sustainable pathway. And you will see the illustrations through this amazing pathway of this woman who uh, has been affected by the cancer and now they, they are survival. Uh, it is an expression of that. And as well, uh, this part, it is about, you know, amazing nurse uh, from the CHU uh, Mohamed VI, you know, in Morocco. And you have decided to portrait uh, the health professionals have died recently of COVID. So I, I would like particularly to, to thank this type of contribution, you know, to, to the exhibit. And sustainable development goals, you know, are a guidance for countries, regions, cities, towns, and as well villages uh, to work towards creating a peaceful, socially inclusive, and environmentally responsible future. The SDG can only be achieved through a shared vision and authentic leadership. And we will be able to address this issue of leadership tonight as we have worked on this intensively with World Academy of Art and Science. It was very well described by uh, Donato uh, Kiniger. Art and culture have an important role to play in creating resilient people, inclusive communities like it was so well demonstrated with our joint effort and our work with Smile Train and they are with us tonight 
and they will be part as well of uh, our amazing panel tonight. And I thank them so much because we have started this uh, initiative together called um, Art Impact for Health. And, and, and I am so touched because today we are able to present in United Nations, you know, what have been done in Peru. It was in March, you know, this year. And, and we will know more, you know, through our panelists. And that it is an extraordinary partnership demonstrate to how we can act and to have impact at country level and express so well today through the beautiful, you, you, you see on the wall, the beautiful cleft mask of 19, 19 artists from Peru. It's amazing and thanks so much to Antonio Segarra and Diane uh, for, uh, to be here from Peru. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> and and they, they are extraordinary, extraordinary people. And, and Antonio is uh, the coordinator of uh, this, uh, this event in Peru. And I thank him so, so much uh, for this uh, amazing creation. He will describe a little bit in details during our panel uh, the spirit of, of, this, um, of this event. It is demonstrated through so many initiatives, as you can see many around the world. And another initiative, it is the Wellness for Cancer, what I have men mentioned to you, through the resilience pathway of this woman with cancer by the artist, the artist Cordelia Guarraro. She's based in the US. And uh, we have as well the initiative called Art in Wellness Collaborative, uh, the healing power of touch, you know, through uh, Tia uh, Crystal. You can see as well the artist Mi Mizo Cole, the Japanese designer, illustrator, and photographer and art director. And as well, uh, Vasilea Direli and Pasia Helen Understand. So they, they are represented uh, here, you know, in our exhibit. So you can see it is uh, amazing because it's really. Uh, a, a big uh, cooperation and co-creation. And finally, I would like to thank, you know, our, uh, our dear um, colleague from Morocco, you know, they are not uh, be able to be with you, you know, with the situation, the current situation. But I thank Zoom on Culture and Health Program in Morocco at hospital level through the portraits of this health professional have died from COVID after they have took care of their patients. And this artist, it is called Abdelia Ezariz, and you can see uh, what he has done. Art can create social inclu inclusion because it transcends borders as a language and age. It is a platform for exchange between practitioners from different sectors and community members, and it, ha it, it has the ability to make us think about ourselves. Other, the place in which we live, and our relationship with the nature and our planet at the wall. And finally, Art Impact for Health and SDG Advocate for Art and Culture to be central to the way we develop our communities and recognize the role of art and culture they play in supporting their commitment to putting people first in the host community in which they operate. It is what all of you as a key partners demonstrate today through your willingness to engage on long term and in sustainable way. Cross sector partnerships like today as leading example can contribute to achieving an inclusive society. And thank you so much again uh, for your presence uh, uh, tonight. Thank you so much. And I think now we can uh, go to our uh, next part. It is, uh, it is the panel we will, uh, we will have tonight, we will have uh, organized. Okay, I will invite uh, our panelists to rejoin us. And um, I will um, describe quickly, quickly uh, each of, of them and, and their uh, very brief biography. Donc, I will call uh, Roland Schwartz. He's a founder. He's a founder and CEO of uh, UNGSII Foundation and World Health Innovation Summit about all SDGs. 
And as I think the presence uh, of him is as well the founder and CEO of United Nations Global Sustainability uh, Index Institute, UNGSI I Foundation. He's the president of Geneva Agap Foundation, founder and CEO of Innovation Publishing and Media, Tenor International in Zurich, Switzerland. And during his uh, last 30 years, he has been devoted to implementing social change. So thank you so much to be uh, with us, Roland. Thank you. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Alessio Pecorario from Vatican. Thank you so much to uh, the presence uh, of, of Vatican Dicastery from promoting integral human development. And as well, uh, um, to the father Augusto, Augusto Sampini is with us as is we is with us uh, tonight as well, uh, and is a representative of as well uh, the Di the Vatican Dicastery from promoting integral and human development. And thank you so much. I know you are uh, as well uh, leading the commission, uh, the, the 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 Augusto Zampini leading the, the commission on uh, COVID-19 about all the SDGs. So thank you so much for, uh, for your presence uh, tonight. It's a, it's a big honor. And uh, we will um, call as well Vincent De Fourny. Vincent De Fourny is a director bureau de, it, it is uh, the director of the UNESCO liaison office in Geneva as the representative of UNESCO to the United Nations in Geneva and other international organizations, he contributes with UNESCO expertise in the implementation of the Agenda 2013. Thank you so much to be uh, with us. I will invite David Fernandez Puyana. is the ambassador, permanent delegation of University of Peace to UN. Uh, office at Geneva, uh, and donc specifically about the, the SDG uh, 16, donc the, the peace, uh, the peace uh, area. And I will invite as well Jean-Guy uh, de Gabriac, is coordinator of the General World Wellness Weekend, and it, it will be to, disc, to, to address specifically the SDG 3, about the well-being and uh, is a founder of uh, this World well Wellness Weekend. We, we are presented in this uh, exhibit. And uh, World Wellness Weekend, it is more than 100 countries, you know, uh, are, are, uh, are able to interconnect, you know, to express uh, uh, the focus on emotional intelligence, you know. And I know you, are, you have been as well the chair of the Global Monitoring uh, Program. Okay, I am very happy to welcome you in, in uh, this panel. And for, for their presence, I will call Diane Erquega, program director, you know, uh, from, from South America and in Smile Train. And she will express as well the, um, the SDG3 about well-being. And finally, I will call Antonio Zegara, uh, it is a, a creative director at Classic Corporation and sits and, and he, he has been able, uh, you know, to manage, for example, a gallery in the city of True Yellow. Is it True Yellow? True Yellow, it's correct? No, it's not correct pronunciation. <laughs> uh, but it is your, your uh, originally the place you come from, you know, and you will tell us, you know, as well uh, about how you promote, in fact, uh, emerging artist, and, and as well, uh, he had uh, done many exhibitions in New York, in, in Miami, you know, in Mexico, you know, and probably more. Uh, and, and thank you so much to be uh, with us uh, uh, tonight. And now I will present as you, you know, some, um, some uh, panelists. They are not physically with us, but they will be... Um, they will have their presence with us through video records or with video conference. And uh, I will uh, mention Albert Schmidt is the CEO of the Dutch uh, Kamet uh, Philanthropy Bremen, 
he will do uh, a video record and specifically about the um, importance of the SDG3 and, and the importance of the music, for example, in terms of the well-being. And we will have Garrett Presch. Garrett Presch is founder and CEO of World Health Innovation Summit. And he will uh, address the SDG3 as well by video record. And Garrett is a social entrepreneur who believes in sharing knowledge. He's the founder and CEO of the World Health Innovation Summit. It is an international platform to set up, the su to, set up uh, to support our health services while creating vibrant communities. And I thank him uh, a lot. We will have as well by visio conference, François Mabille uh, is um, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Catholic Catholic universities. He was a professor of political science at the University Catholic de Lille, and he founds the research center on peace uh, with uh, Joseph Meila. Uh, so I, I am so happy he can be uh, with us with uh, this conference. And um, our fantastic um, panelist as well, Pamela Sheran. Uh, will be uh, with us by visio conference. She is vice president, comprehensive clef care, uh, smile train uh, about the, um, the SDG three uh, and about uh, what we have done together with WHO. You know about art impact for health. And I am very happy uh, to 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 receive you know all this amazing. Uh, Uh, speaker today, you know, and, and to debate with you about uh, the role of art and culture for uh, to promote SDG and to foster, in fact, the implementation of SDG. And I will uh, I will start uh, with uh, with Roland uh, uh, about you know uh, some some key question, you know, but it, it, the question is for all. All of you. <laughs> uh, OK, I will just uh, express the question and if you can um, answer it. Donc, the first question is, what is your vision to establish effective bridge between different SDG? Have you already some concrete examples are in place to inspire us to design more synergy between sector, discipline and stakeholders? The second question is how the culture and art can support SDG from your perspective, specifically to communicate about the main challenge of 21 century and mobilize engaged community over the world to come together and co-create solution. What is your contribution through your institution initiative to foster the implementation of SDG and to have real impact? What SDG can do or inspire for people and communities over the world to trigger the best human development potential and how? And the last question, what is your key message to move on the concrete implementation of SDG and not just the talk? The floor is yours. Can we do it there? Yes. I brought something with me, a virus. It's not COVID-19. It's probably COVID-1785. For those with good eyes, they could read what is written here. It is what became famous later on as the Song of Joy. Freude schöner Götterfunken. It was a poem. And this poem is reaching you no matter whether you're wearing your mask or not. And that is what I want to share with you today. Friedrich Schiller wrote it in 1985 in a time where we had secret police everywhere and where it was not easy to even write an innocent poem like this one, get it published. No, he had to first ask permission to get it published. I will not bore you with German language because you all know the Song of Joy. But what is important 
for our evening for everything what Isabel is trying to reach, not only tonight, but in the coming months and years with you and with the rest of the world, is almost at the end of this poem. In this poem, he writes, Everybody should become a friend to somebody else, right? And he ends that poem by saying, and if you don't manage to at least become a friend for one human being on this planet, you should rather leave the room. I was intended to burn this virus. So you can see sometimes viruses can vanish. And secret police is strong and make sure that people can't read these things. The strongest enemy of these type of viruses is the author himself. Friedrich Schiller, he was not satisfied with the poem when he wrote it. It took him several years until he thought, now it has the shape, I would like to share it with others. But there was a young guy, and I want to share with you the story of this young guy tonight who heard this poem when he was 16. And he was still in Bonn. His name is Ludwig. Ludwig heard this poem and he thought, this is heaven. This is my key to heaven. And usually when people get excited, they start immediately to do something with this. But not Ludwig. Ludwig did a lot of other things. He started writing piano music. He started writing symphonies. He, write, he wrote op operas. <clears throat> he waited until he was 54. And imagine he heard, he read this poem when he was 16. And it took him until he was 54 that he thought, now I'm good enough to share what I think, what this poem is for me and for you, now I'm ready. And listen to how he defines that. Does this sound like a start of a symphony? Isn't it more sounding like people trying to, you still hear me, right? <clears throat> Tuning their instruments. And he continues. In this dialogue between tuning and catching attention. Not as a 17 year old or an 18 year old or a 19 year old, as the musician back then. There was no other composer in that time who was more famous than him. And he starts with this. He sets the stage for something and he does something which is irritating for everybody who knows a little bit about music. You can't do this. But he did it. After this first movement, he comes to a second movement, to a third movement, to a third movement. Um, and then all of a sudden, he starts with this, the fourth. Movement. This sounds more like a thunderstorm. So, copper. This sounds more like a thunderstorm. This is more like, not like I want to share with you a great message. And after he sets this stage, Thank <laughs> you. 
He goes back to where he was. quiet he's not loud and again it's this guy who is 54 who is deaf who can hardly hear the other instruments who is torn in his own life by being sick by having going through all the misery you can imagine and then if you add 10 times more to it you get close to the life he was leading and that's the stage he sets, where he says, I want to be a friend of you, and how about you become a friend of at least one other human being? He repeats this intro. hear it. But you get an idea, right? It's just one part of the orchestra, only the celli playing the song of joy. And he's teaching us the most important lesson. If we only say one thing once, it might not get heard. If we say it twice, it might not get heard. Listen to this, all of a sudden the violins join. And you all remember somebody in this building, Michael Muller, who started this perception change group by saying, if we want to reach something together, which is called the United Nations, we have to work together. We need to get out of our silos. We need to get out of our beautiful buildings and get together on this one theme, which is you need to be at least friend of one on this world. And if you can't make it, then rather leave. Meanwhile, he has other instruments join. And it goes on and on. I will not bore you with this because you should hear it in peace and not with me blah blahing in between. But the main point is, after he gets all the instruments together, performing the melody, still nobody was singing it. And in this big drama, then he says, he has this tenor stand up and say, hey, friends, don't make this noise. Let's do nicer music together. What does this mean? Again, a 54-year-old, the best of the best, the one who is adored not only in his country, but all over Europe. When he died, there were more than 20,000 people walking after his uh, sarcophag. He was known. And this guy says, let's not make this music. We can do better. And we have to do better if we want to reach this goal. This was 1824. We are now in 2020. It's 200 years further. There's one difference between back then when Ludwig, who was the first musician, by the way, who was dealing eye in eye with the big leaders. You all know the Vienna Congress took place in Vienna. 
And guess whom did the Tsar from Russia wanted to meet with and not only listen to him, but talk to him, Ludwig? Who did the French guy want to talk to? Ludwig. He was speaking with all of them and he was talking about this poem without being able to turn it into music back then. But he reminded them, you know, we need to get better. One difference in 2020, we have the SDGs. Ludwig didn't. Ludwig had nothing to refer to. For us, it is rather easy. We can point to all these heads of states, the 193 heads of states, who agree to all the 17 SDGs, who agree to the 169 targets. Among these 169 targets, you have one full catalog <laughs> around SDG 3 health. And if you listen into Beethoven and you understand what it is, you learn the best about mental health. And that is my conclusion, what can we do this year? Pope Francis started already years ago a concert series. I said, we need to do concerts for those who are left behind. Imagine we do this this year. Imagine we invite those who are left behind in 25 cities and in five indigenous communities. And we are not only playing Beethoven to them, but we explain what Beethoven wants. That Beethoven was one of them. You have no idea how often Beethoven was imprisoned because they caught him being drunk and they had no clue that it was Beethoven. So he had to spend the night in prison and then get freed by the Archbishop of Vienna, whom he was teaching how to compose music. This year, on the 4th of Advent, how about we do these concerts in 25 cities around the world, where we share Beethoven, where we share fantastic meal, but most important, where we share time with those we invite around 500 people and where we listen and where we exchange what Ludwig could mean for them, how Ludwig may, maybe inspires them to change. And we don't leave it by that. We come back on Christmas and we come back again on New Year's Eve because we all know if you want to change your life, it's not done by an event. You need to still have energy, still wanting to change your life when you are back home, whatever you have to call home. That's what I think art and health and the SDGs have in common, which is basically SDG 17. Good teamwork. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. It's a big huge honor being here this evening with you and uh, all of your guests. And uh, let me start by uh, conveying to you uh, Cardinal Tarkson greetings, Prefect of our Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Uh, His Eminence assures me that uh, uh, he is with us and uh, would like to wish to, to, to bring to you his deep sentiments of esteem and gratitude. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been asked to provide uh, an insight of the importance uh, to invest and in and implement integral human development for all people, for all the dimensions of each person to reach SDGs. Um, I'm very honored by your interest in knowing the holistic vision, approaches and best strategies that our dicasteries fosters toward the implementation of SDGs through art and culture and how effective multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approaches can be implemented at the worldwide level. How can each human being have the possibility to participate and contribute to the common good and solidarity processes to create a holistic vision and implementation of SDGs? Uh, there is an assumption for that, the one explained by the Director General of WHO, the, which is dialogue. Uh, of course, we need a proper dialogue, no? Uh, in, in philosophical term, we could say uh, a Socratic dialogue, no? Through interrogation between two or more interlocutors aims at correcting an initial error in order to arrive at a shared truth to be always questioned. 
which is opposed to the sophistical dialogue, no? Uh, misleading the others. I'm coordinating the security task force of the Vatican, and today we, we would use the category of propaganda and uh, fake news, no? One of the dimensions that they cover is cybersecurity. This is really important. So a true dialogue that uh, can go beyond the natural prejudice that we all have to come here in places and uh, present or even worse, impose our, our truth with the assumption to being of the side of the reason. On the contrary, I'm here hoping that uh, I can learn more about you, uh, your work, and uh, your guests. Uh, and this is a proper expression of love. As uh, Pope Francis says in his letter encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, no? published very, very recently. Indeed, love or caritas is the active love for one's neighbor, which is expressed above all through works of altruism and mercy especially in the police, in the cities. Caritas rejoices the presence of the others, listens attentively to the others, shares to the others joys and sorrows. Uh, love is not merely eros or interper interpersonal friendship. It is also social or, and political. For example, no, to stay concrete, doesn't an I vision of uh, love without charity, without SDGs implementation, risk making us abstract or even hypocritical. Uh, I like the uh, Mr. Mueller no? idea or uh, vision. Uh, but let me move on to describe how the perception of development understood in a holistic sense can contribute to the artistic dimension also, cross-cutting all the dimensions of love. Uh, we just heard the, the beautiful music. Allow me just a short reflection with another music, which is La Divina Commedia, uh, Dante Alighieri's poetry. The poet lived uh, uh, in a time well away from secular societies when the presence of God and faith informed the life of every person. Many of Inferno's moments of spectacular imagery and symbolic powers have also to illuminate one of Dante's major themes, the perfection of God's justice. Dante's narration cannot but follow doctrinal Christian values. But there is also the police dimension, not the one that uh, Pope Francis is insisting on. Uh, the police dimension love is very deep till the point of making Dante's poetry also a form of universal fraternity, precisely. Think to the presence of Saladin in the spirit man, you know, the important souls in the limbo. It seems like a a sort of anticipation of the dialogue between Pope Francis and the Imam Al-Taib. Uh, but this also, this police dimension is also the denunciation of the political assertion suffered by Medivida Italy and the invocation of, all, of our homeland that is both hurtly and ultra hurtly. Dante's point is that uh, as civil beings, we are responsible not only for our action, but also for their results. Many people he present in hell were men and women of prestige or power. In the, in, the, in, the, in the good palace, no? Uh, people in a position to influence others, either directly or by example, and in a way, in one way or another, they all find, they all failed. The suffering, the violence, the anarchy of hell are a result of their failure to act up to the responsibilities or their outright abuse of those responsibilities. Selfishness, greed for mercy, uh, greed for, uh, for money, power, or pleasure is the basis of the injustice that reigns in hell, as charity is the basis of the justice that operates in heaven. So maybe we can see that Dante is a, a sort of a supporter of SDGs of the time. Uh, or I don't know if this is an improper comparison, but in poetry, love begins with the personal nuances of encounter of the other. <coughs> And in the Inferno, uh, even uh, with this uh, uh, theory, this, this vision behind, um, Dante builds a great deal of tension between the objective impersonality of God's justice and the character Dante's human sympathy for the souls that he sees around him. We can see that in famous Canto Quinto, here the last full are carried away by an incessant storm which symbolizes the strength of sexual passion which they could not resist in life. As said, Dante is an, has an intense, intensive uh, relationship with the dimension of sin and cannot but condemn Paolo and Francesca, the two, the two brother-in-law uh, and main characters of, the section, of this section of the, of the L, in laws who have indulged in lustful passions by cheating uh, Francesca's husband, who was the, the brother of Paolo. 
From an artistic point of view, this is even worse because his intention is even to condemn literature that celebrates sensual and unspiritualized love. But listen uh, to this kind of music, this other kind of music, listen to the word that the, the Sommo Poeta uses when Francesca, Francesca describes her scene. Amor, che il cor gentil ratto s'apprende, prese costui della bella persona che mi fu tolta, il modo ancora m'offende. Love, which soon seizes on a well-born heart, seizes me for that fair body's sake, whereof I was deprived, and still the way offends me. Amor, che a nulla amato amar perdona, mi prese del costui piacer si forte, e come vedi, ancora non m'abbandona. Love, which has sold us from loving no one that's love, sees me so strongly for his love of me, that, as you see, it doesn't leave me yet, even in the inferno. Amor condusse noi ad una morte, che in attenda, attende chi a vita ci spense. Love to a death in, con, in common led us on, kinds, eyes, a ways, who quenched our life. Paolo's uh, bro uh, brother, no? The, the, while one was saying this, Dante writes, the other spirit so sorely wept, and that out of sympathy is wanted away, as truth about to die, and fell as false a body that is dead. Uh, can you see the, the reason for that? The poet is not only, is not, I would say, at all a repressor of sinners. He feels the full weight of his own weakness to the point that he could be said to have written the entire poem because of a carnal obsession that is to meet once again Beatrice eyes and sublimate, for, for I would say, a sinful passion. So, art, in precisely an holistic way, Dante Alighieri poetry combines the many dimensions of love that we have explored supremely. supremely. The heroic attraction for Beatrice that pushes him on a journey through the three ultra world realms, the friendship that he finds again in Virgilio, master and brother who guides him in hell in purgatory before returning him to his beloved, to his beloved woman, and finally, the Divina Commedia is also Caritas, the supreme artistic gift that the poet gives to humanity. Was, echoes, was music as echoes in the universe? The beauty and the merit of art, as it has been said, is not uh, uh, that it is simply an expression of human skill and creativity, which brings joy and inspiration. It is also is a holistic endeavor that connects body and soul, humans to each other, humanity to the divine, and there to, to the universe. In the words of uh, Lewis, art has no survival value, rather it is one of those things which give value to survival. In the same way, integral human development is not only an exercise of economic restructuring, but is rather a pursuit of connecting humanity to itself, to the earth and to the universe. In building infrastructures and systems that sustain survival, integral human development also insists on those things which give value to survival such as art and culture. The SDGs embody this vision for a society that both sustain and inspire its members, and the Catholic Church works tirelessly to pursue these aims. In conclusion, despite the fact that the Catholic Church has engendered some of the most compelling art throughout the centuries, the Church's commitment to creativity lies not only in its cultural and artistic, artistic output, but also in its pursuit to heal the world's ills particularly the virus, no? the virus of indifference and racism uh, that rage more fervently than even COVID-19. In his recent catechesis series, Pope Francis reasserted the church's commitment to the preferential option for the poor, which is central to the gospel. That is the need for all our action to prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable. The SDGs are a prime example of an efficacious Despite the fact that the Catholic Church has engendered some of the most compelling art throughout the centuries, the Church's commitment to creativity lies not only in its cultural and artistic, artistic output, but also in its pursuit to heal the world's ills, particularly the virus, no? the virus of indifference and racism uh, that rage more fervently than even COVID-19. In his recent catechesis series, Pope Francis reasserted the Church's commitment to the preferential option for the poor, which is central to the Gospel, that is the need for all our action to prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable. The SDGs are a prime example 
of an efficacious, efficacious strategy for this role. For Christians, love is what animates all creativity to bring justice for all the poor. Love motivates us to care for our most vulnerable brothers and sisters, our mother hearts included. Love is both the origin and the destination, and creativity is the vehicle. Actually, love moves. Um, actually, love is creative. And to this end, the Pope instituted the COVID-19 Commission with explicit hope that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the pandemic would bring an exclusive opportunity to imagine new structures and creatively pursue their fulfillment. Our work, particularly in the Task Force on Security, which I coordinate, resolves around developing an expanded partnership and pursuing dreams of global peace, justice, and solidarity through creativity, such as we have in this conference. Pope Francis has encouraged us to use this time for inventing and creativity, take care of the now for the sake of tomorrow, always creatively, with a sense of simple creativity capable of inventing something new each day. Indeed, without creativity, without culture, without art, we cannot, in, we cannot imagine the fulfillment of SDGs. We would be hopelessly stuck in uh, the lockdown of our unjust violent system. Again, the Pope says, we have to respond to our confinement with all our creativity. We can either get depressed or alienated through media that can take us out of reality, or we can get creative. At home, we need an apostolic creativity with a, year, with a yearning to express our faith in community. This apostolic creativity drives us towards solidarity, towards the common good, towards a new world. Thank you so much. speak from here, <laughs> I think it's the same, <coughs> and I will be short. You, you know, UNESCO has, has a long-standing long commitment to recognizing the importance of the arts for human development and for peace, enabling and enriching the core values that connect us all. UNESCO's approach to arts education is two-pronged. Learning about arts, about the arts as discipline, and expanding, our, and expanding our knowledge of cultural diversity and learning through the arts, integrate them into education to improve and enhance learning, developing creativity and critical thinking. Arts education bring, bridges the divide between the three dimensions of learning, the cognitive, the social and emotional, and the behavioral. As such, it actively supports the achievement of SDG 4, and more specifically, target 4.7. And it contributes to the achievement of all the SDGs. No way, no, there is no discussion about that. In November 19, 2019, the UNESCO member states adopted two resolutions referring respectively to arts education. One is the proclamation of World Art Day, and on the promotion on the awareness of arts education and International Arts Education Week. The resolution states the importance of reinforcing the links between, and I quote, the links between artistic creations and society and highlight the contribution of the arts to sustainable development. Of course, we could discuss and we could elaborate a lot about arts and, and the importance of arts in the, in the, in the uh, SDGs, uh, but, but I would like to maybe keep only six key messages, and it is six key messages coming from the member states and from the UNESCO's experience with the member states in arts education more specifically. One is about teaching through the arts helps meet diverse learning needs and approaches. Second, arts education facilitates learning on outcomes while developing motivation and critical thinking. Three, arts education contributes to the psychological support. Fourth, arts education inspired by living heritage connects learner to their community's heritage and environment. And environment. Fifth, 
art education develops new creative talents and thereby renews creativity for the future. And the last one, art education is conducive to, conducive to the development of resilience and adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, very deeply for organizing this event, uh, Ms. Isabel, as well the support and the organization of, uh, from UNOC, and thank you, Sigrun and Thomas, for being here and organizing this event with uh, the mission of uh, Peru and the Vatican. But uh, would like then uh, to recall that this year is very specific, very special year, not only for the COVID-19, but we are celebrating three different commemorations. We are celebrating the commemoration of the League of Nations, 100th anniversary. We are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the creation of the United Nations and the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the UN University for Peace by the General Assembly Resolution in 1980. Uh, a resolution promoted in that time by the president of Costa Rica, Carazzo. But what is that, that value? But why we are discussing this year about multilateralism? Because we have uh, since 100 years and a system to uh, peacefully settle the conflicts. This is the value of the League of Nations. And uh, as you remember, was established after the accord and the Treaty of the, Versa the Versailles Treaty. But this, uh, but I would like to refer to the UN Charter, in particular to the peace notion of the Charter, because the preambular part of the Charter starts with, uh, with the peoples of the United Nations, one of the purposes to save generations from the score of war. But the issue is, we fail as a humanity about this main purpose of the UN? I don't think so. We, if, we, uh, if we see uh, the conflicts uh, in, the, in the past, in the past uh, years and the number, in accordance with some of the most uh, relevant institutes, in, uh, in Sweden, they say that the number of, uh, of uh, civilians in, in our conflict die are less than in the times of the Cold War. And I think uh, that maybe that maybe the United Nations has been doing something in particular in the promotion of this positive notion of peace. But the, the, the one of the, um, I mean, maybe one of the question is what is peace, no? Because we are discussing about, uh, we need to, dis, uh, to focus and to identify, no? And to focus on the, uh, um, SDG number 16, no, on peace and uh, on peace, but we don't have a definition of peace. We could be here for uh, cent I mean, uh, even centuries, no, and, and discussing about what is peace. But for this reason, what is only one thing to go to the UN chapter, and we can see in the chapter peace is always connected with the notion of security. For 75 years, uh, uh, peace has been kidnapped by the notion of security, but peace is something else that the absence of conflict. Peace is the promotion and the protection of all human rights by all, the civil and political rights, the economic and social and cultural rights, and in particular, the right to development. But there is only one article in the chapter that referred to this positive notion of peace, what is Article 1.3, that referred to the, the, to the world peace, no? the, to this notion of world peace. And this has been the window uh, in the United Nations for member states, for NGOs, then to promote and to codify this positive notion of peace, but now going and referring to the to the SDGs. SDGs is referring a peace, no? But it's connected with a strong institutions. But what is the basis for inst a strong institution for democracy? Is the notion of rule of law. If we don't have the, I mean, and we uh, we don't promote this notion of rule of law, democracy does not exist. And uh, and to finalize my 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 short intervention because I want to be short like my predecessor. Uh, it's a big honor, first, first of all, to stay with you, with all of you here. Um, um, it's a very learning process to me. You know? But uh, uh, in, in 2016, uh, UNESCO uh, published an important book, uh, Long World to Peace, uh, uh, towards uh, the, uh, the culture of prevention. And then in UNESCO, uh, we, as uh, UNESCO before, no? now in UP, but I, I feel even no, very close to UNESCO, and uh, um, we discussed with all the UN system about what they think about this notion of peace. And finally, this book was presented in, in, in Geneva in, uh, last, in 2018. It was a very successful book. It was 
an example of cooperation among all the UN entities, program funds, specialized agencies in the UN system about the conception of this positive notion of peace. And last, and last thing is the uh, issue of arts. Um, in this, in this sense, I would like to recall that uh, in two last year we organized here with uh, with UNESCO again uh, an exhibition about Otman. Otman, uh, uh, Otman is uh, one of the most important calligraphers in in, uh, in the Middle East. This art, we uh, brought this exhibition uh, to the Vatican, and it was very interesting to see, you know, the the power of arts. The, for the first time ever, uh, the, uh, the, His Holiness, the Pope Francis, firstly, he opened the exhibition, met with an, uh, an, uh, an, a diplomat, a high representative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in Rome. No? It's only to show the power of arts, and you, you refer to the power of law, but also the power of arts in the promotion of peace uh, in the world. No? And, and thank you very much for all your uh, participation, and, and see you next time. <laughs> Gabriel, and thank you so much to tell us more about the world next program. Thank you so very much. Um, are you turning the camera? Um, Isabel, I, I saw that you removed your mask when you were here, so I think it's a safe yeah. distance, uh, and I will remove mine. Thank you so, so very much. Um, my heart is overjoyed. Some people call this day Tuesday. Uh, I call it what a day. Uh, I was in Paris this morning um, exchanging with mayors of French cities on how to be better together, on how to grow more um, wellness, health, in alignment with the SDG3, with uh, good health and well-being for all. Um, that was this morning, and now I'm here with you in Geneva, here at the uh, United Nations. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite a trip, uh, physically, and quite a trip um, to see how far we've grown from 2017, when the idea of the World Wellness Weekend was, um, was born, with only two countries participating, France and Belgium. 2018, 88 countries participated. 2019, we had 98 countries, and this year, last September, just uh, exactly a month ago, we had 109 countries participating despite COVID-19, which means that with 1,123 uh, venues participating in the World Wellness Weekend, uh, there were at least one fun, free, meaningful uh, wellness activity organized for people, residents or tourists in 500 and 43 cities around the world. The World Wellness Weekend is a non-for-profit event that was launched in alignment with SDG3, good health and well-being for all. And it really grew. Um, it grew with you, Isabel, as the ambassador for the arts of the World Wellness Weekend. Um, I know people call you Isabel Waxmut, that's your name, but I believe in the power of wow, and for me you are Isabel Wow Smith, uh, if, if I take this liberty with your parents' name. Thank you. Um, when, when we see this exhibition here uh, embodied through the work of uh, Peruvian artists, through the, this beautiful sculpture with the, the, the piece on top of the earl just holding by a thread, just holding by a thread. Um, and, and artists uh, also from uh, um, Arts and Wellness, Wellness for Cancer. It, it fills my heart with joy to see that this exhibition in part um, and with the world of, of Karin Schaub and, and the photographers started this summer online uh, with uh, the World Wellness Weekend website uh, and a special um, thank you to Moments also, which created an online gallery for us. Now, this, this exhibition was um, uh, seen in a, in, a, in a forest near, um, near here in, in the city of Brittany, and it's here at the United Nations. So things are, are moving forward and forward. The World Wellness Weekend, as you have seen, uh, as you have said, Isabelle, with the, the themes that are here, um, are just a number of five. Um, sleep and creativity, because through the dreams we can have, through the, the good night's sleep, 
um, there's definitely a, a difference we can make in the following day that, that starts afresh. Good sleep. Nutrition, what we choose to put in our plate, the quantity, but also food and immunity, and God knows we need more of that. Vitality and movement, serenity and mindfulness. And this little finger there, maybe the most powerful of all, not just to clean your ear, but this one, this five pillar, is sense of purpose and solidarity. Um, there's so much we need to learn as humanity with the, the, the dark times, the uncertainty that we are feeling, that, that we're going through, the pandemic that is turning into a syndemic also, not just the, uh, the health situation we have, but also the economic, with 180 million people that have gone into unemployment since March, with the political issues that we have and the uh, upcoming elections, plural. So many things that are happening, but um, when you ask the question, what are we doing to implement really what we, um, what we care about? How do we walk our talk? We have taken this um, idea of wellness for all, but not just wellness for all, wellness by all. We're trying to inspire and empower people around the world so that they decide to choose in which pillar they want to spend a little bit more time is it going to be sleep, nutrition, vitality, serenity, or solidarity? As of now, there are 940 million volunteers in the world helping others. The gift of time is, is the most important that we can do. We decided to have a wellness pledge with the World Wellness Weekend, finding um, an area, finding a pillar where people want to express more, want, want to dig deeper into themselves, and then find a friend, like you said, Roland. Find a friend, find one person. We call that person a wellness buddy or a fitness buddy. Someone you will be um, accountable to when you decide to take an actions for your, for your life. And then we realize that wellness doesn't start with me. It starts with we. And it grows with all of you. In the fact that when we decide in which pillar we want to spend more time and grow healthier with boosting our immunity system, more vital, more, more, more serene. Um, this is when, with the help of a friend, we can decide to turn a practice, a regular practice, a sustainable practice, into caring for others. And we have taken this wellness pledge where people are encouraged to say, if they smoke, for instance, um, just try to not buy a, a pack of, uh, of cigarettes for a few days, see how long you can last without cigarettes. And those 10 euros, about 10 euros, depending on which country you are in, those 10 euros, give them to a charity. With 10 euros, uh, charities can serve 100 meals for kids, 100 meals, not just 10 to 20 cigarettes, 100 meals. They can, um, they can school a kid for one month with breakfast included. Maybe that will be the most significant meal of that kid. Um, 400 days of clean water brought by UNICEF. And the list goes on. 10 euros, 10 dollars, 10 whatever you have if you decide to, to move like this. To conclude, uh, I was deeply touched by the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, three letters. And when we were in Davos in January, with uh, Gareth, who will speak, but especially with you, Roland, and with all the people who had, um, who were joined around you uh, with the uh, SDGs and, and the, the UNGSII. Um, I added three letters that can be really uh, inspiring and empowering people to take these SDGs at heart and, and implement them in life. And that's fun, F-U-N. If, if you show two directions, one right, one left, and one says fun, and the other one says boring, I, I guarantee people will take the fun way, the non-conventional way. This can lead us forward, this can have us united, and this can definitely, uh, uh, hopefully, make a, a better day. So that in this pandemic, uh, we learn how to be human and more human, but also how we learn how to be kind, human and kind in the same way. I'll finish with our signs, our symbol for the World Wellness Weekend. For us, wellness, that can be described in many ways, is about a victory of the mind and a victory of the body. And when the mind and the body come together, we have wellness. So 
I wish for you wellness for all, wellness by all. Thank you so very much. Message, uh, video record uh, from Gareth. Uh, Dear friends, um, my apologies, I can't be there in person. Um, unfortunately, COVID has confined us all to our home. And um, I just want to congratulate Isabel um, for the initiative, Arts for SDGs. And I do hope that the conference in Geneva goes very well today. Um, I've been asked to give a couple of um, to answer a couple of questions around SDGs and how they can impact um, and my vision. So, what is my vision to to effectively bridge between the SDGs? Well, uh, we have the World Health Innovation Summit, and that's a platform that brings together all citizens. Uh, initially around SDG three, good health and well-being, patients, clinicians, managers, voluntary sector, education, and the business community. So that's the platform that we have, and we work very closely with the UNGSII Foundation. And I know my colleague Roland Schatz is there today, um, and our vision is to bring that across the world. So it's a platform for 7 billion people, and it's focused on prevention, um, which is what we need at the moment, particularly in this COVID situation. The next question around, have we got some concrete exa examples? Well, absolutely. Um, in 2015, uh, I left the NHS, the National Health Service, and joined and set up a social enterprise, the World Health Innovation Summit. And that platform, what we did was we set up pillars off the back of the event. The initial concept was to um, bring together all the stakeholders to improve people's health and well-being, but also to support the local health service. And how do you do that? Well, we know that we face huge challenges around healthcare and health system design at the moment. Um, particularly from the point of view of recruitment and retention of staff, we're 18 million short by 2030. But that also brings us an opportunity to create new and meaningful jobs. And we also have an, an economy, we can create a circular economy around prevention rather than disease. So that's where we focus on prevention rather than disease. And that's very much the topic of discussion today, using the arts as a creative force to improve people's health and well-being. And we know that that works. The next question around how you know can culture and art support the SDGs from my perspective? Well, what I've seen and from working with Ingolf Ferdner and the SDG Orchestra, I we've all we already started and we're doing a lot of work with the Vatican, and I know my, my friend from the Vatican is there, Alessio. Um, we're looking at how do we mobilize large numbers of people through the arts, through concerts, through and with Isabella support in other jurisdictions launching arts for SDGs. We recently had a discussion with colleagues in Munich, and this week I've had some discussions locally here in Carlisle College with the arts students. We can improve people's health and well-being through the arts. We know that this works. Music, for example, you know, painting, photography, all these activities improve our mental health and well-being. We have a huge opportunity through the arts to mobilize billions of people. Let's take that opportunity. Um, my contribution and the initiative in terms of implementing the SDGs to have impact and have real impact, well, through the WIS platform, we have a number of pillars, which is WIS Kids, which focuses on children's health, well-being at an early age, WIS Seniors, or sorry, WIS at Work, yeah, workplace, mental health and well-being, with seniors, and then with green and with tech. So with green covers energy, waste and water, so the environment. So you can see through the platform, you have a way and a means to access billions of people across the world. We do this already with technology, but let's look at the future. How do we create sustainable models of healthcare? How can we create the future society and the common good? Well, that can be done through our platforms. We've seen how these large technology companies have done it. Now it's up to the individual and up to us to take that opportunity and take the action. We have demonstrated a pound invested 36 back in societal impact. We have a huge opportunity there to create value for all economies and grow them and grow purposeful jobs as well. Um, 
SDGs inspire people around the world and trigger human development. For me, of course, it's SDG3. I've kind of outlined how that would work. Um, I very much believe that health is wealth, but also SDG4, quality education. There's many others. And an important one, of course, is SDG17, partnership for the goals. How do we do that? As I've articulated, bring people together, create opportunities as you are doing today, start working together, show leadership, stand up, take action, take risks. Very important that we work together. And also we support those taking those actions because it's difficult. We all know how hard it is to move forward and we need that support. It's very important. And um, finally, my key message and concrete in terms of getting concrete, we need to work together. And um, all our agencies need to come together as well what we're doing at the moment in Geneva and we need to mobilize as a collective unit. Let's use our wisdom, let's use our knowledge and also we have the finance, we know that, we know that there is investment there to go into these projects. Let's bring that together and let's mobilize and let's deliver the SDGs and leave no one behind by 2030. I'll leave it there and thank you very much for, for you know having me today and I wish you every success um, today. Thanks. Great, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Can I see a thumbs up if you can hear me? All right, great, awesome. Maybe I'll do the wellness. I'll do the wellness. <laughs> um, great. Well, so thank you so much for having me virtually join. Um, I know it's it's in the evening for you, and many of you are um, due to get to have dinner and to celebrate this wonderful kickoff of the exhibit before you. I just want to just give a couple minutes to explain a bit about, um, well, again, my name is Pamela Sheeran. I represent Smile Train. But I want to share a bit about our experience working with Isabel, um, enjoying working with Isabel Waxmuth and the Art Impact for Health project. Also to share a bit more about our organization's way of working um, in case our experience can help inspire others or inspire ourselves, as Dr. Tedros said at the beginning of our session, to continually evolve and have new ideas so we can truly achieve the SDGs in the end. Um, so before I get into the, a few of the panel questions, just to, to share with you what is Cleflin Palette, because you see the masks around you that reflect what Cleflin Palette is. It's one of the most common birth differences a baby can be born with worldwide. On average, in a healthy population, about one in every 700 um, babies are born with a cleft, which translates to about 200,000 new babies being born every year. At first, when babies are born with a cleft, they often struggle with feeding and with thriving, some areas even surviving. But even with surgery, um, with or without surgery, I should say, they can have other challenges related to oral health, speech therapy, psychosocial development. They need a, they need a, care, a team to go to, a health care team to go to, to get ongoing support throughout their life, to, be full, to receive full rehabilitation and care. And that's where Smile Train steps in. Um, our model is actually very special. When we were founded in 1999, uh, our model was all about partnership with SDG 17, before that was even named SDG 17, really. Um, we know that really the true way to have, um, to offer this, this essential care for these children, for these families that are so often marginalized and don't have access to care and their, and their outcomes are then compounded as they grow, um, was to make sure that local medical professionals had the training, SDG 4, um, to be able to stay in their own local communities so they could actually be their own local heroes, offer care for these families, and contribute to the strengthening of healthcare systems overall. So that's a bit about Cleflin Palette and Smile Train. Um, but now I want to move on to the panel questions, and I, I will go very briefly, because again, I know I want you all to be able to go celebrate and toast this beautiful exhibit, and also hear from my colleague Diane Arquiega um, and our partner artist Antonio Zegara. So the first panel question was around our vision to establish effective bridges across the SDGs. As many of the other panelists have said, the key for this is SDG 17 partnerships. Um, I did just speak about how the model of SMILE Train, the way that we work, we partner with local medical professionals, give them grants and training 
so they can offer care locally to children with cleft limb palate and their families. Um, but also through this, even this Art Impact for Health project um, with Isabel and Dr. Uh, Isabel Waxmuth, you know, we, we came together in true partnership. And true partnership is means effective and successful uh, in co-vision. And it leads to cohesion and appropriate product design. Personal agendas and, and, and organizational agendas are to the side. No rigid views are, have any place. But you come together um, with a joint vision around treating children with cleft and making sure that they can leverage art and culture to find healing. And the result is truly beautiful and organic. And you can see that again through the mass around the room. Another panel question was, what contribution does Smile Train have towards fostering the real impact of SDGs? Again, I come back to SDG 17 because of the way that our model is, how we're rooted in local partnerships. And you can see the results of, our, of this model through our achievements over the last 20 years and, and, of course, through what you see around the room with this beautiful art. Um, with the local partnership model, Smile Train, we work with more than 1,100 local hospitals across more than 70 countries currently today. We have supported more than 1.5 million people affected by cleft limb palate to receive safe surgery. Um, and we've empowered more than 2,100 local medical professionals through this model um, and through our grant programs. And again, all that is through partnership. And it's driving, though, SUG3, the health for all. We want to make sure that children born with a cleft have access to the care they need uh, so they can live to their greatest potential. Another panel question was around how culture and art can support SDGs from your perspective, specifically um, around the challenges of the 21st century. I, the main challenges we find, Smile Train finds when we are trying to achieve our, our mission of, of offering um, local care to children with cleft limb palate is around uh, the fact that the children are often hidden, misunderstood, um, that they're, they're un, they're, they're, we're not able to reach them, and that the communities themselves around them don't understand the care that they can receive. Um, and actually, art has helped through the years overcome those challenges. We've seen that when um, there's been murals at hospitals to help um, the patients and the children and their families feel more secure when they're getting care. So they feel more welcome. So they're more apt to then become unhidden and come back and get care. We've also seen that local dance and art events um, for families affected by collapse bring them together in a community, make them feel maybe again, ensure they come back to get ongoing care and also to make sure the community understands what cleft is and that they're not casting aside um, this very large community of children in need. We've also seen with art, um, we've organized choirs for children to help practice their speech, their self-esteem. But again, this art form brings the children together in such a beautiful way for them to express themselves, to develop and to overcome the challenges around cleft care. Um, we've created documentaries that have um, brought tremendous uh, awareness around the world about cleft limb palate. Again, an extremely important art form. And a unique art form um, that helps overcome these challenges is a virtual art. And we actually have a virtual surgery simulator that helps train SUG3, SUG4, excuse me, um, the medical professionals we work with so that they um, are empowered and can offer better, safer, higher quality care locally through this online simulator. Through a it's essentially a virtual art form. Okay, another panel question was around how do we inspire people and in communities over the world um, with the SDGs? And I think that's where with SDG three health for all. And again, many of the panelists have said this. You can, with, with giving access to health to a child born with cleft, so that they can reach their fullest potential is extremely powerful. You know, Smile Train, we talk a lot about it in their smile, but it's their entire personhood. So imagine what that person was able to achieve in their life as a result of getting the care they needed when they're younger. They're no longer cast aside. They have health for all access um, to achieving their fullest potential. And I think the inspiration is then of what then they become and what then they're able to do that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for um, the dedication and the strive towards S the SDGs, specifically SDG3. And one of our, our key messages is a closing note so I can pass on to my colleagues. Um, Smile Train, we're a small and nimble and focused team um, and that we are bound by, and we are really founded in the idea of sustainable partnerships. Um, our partnerships are su super local, and that's what Diane will speak to, the experience in Peru. Uh, and they're also super global, and that's where we're here with you tonight. We value art and culture and the beautiful effects on the cleft community and the medical community and also ourselves. We're dedicated to supporting one another to achieve the SDGs. And our message um, really is around calling everyone to be behind, really be based in this, in, around the same notion of um, effective partnership, to be adaptive, to be open-minded, inclusive of art and culture, 
um, to create smiles for the future world, smiles embedded in the achievement of the SDGs. So thank you so much again for having me join virtually. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and I hope to see you all in person another time soon. the floor to Diana uh, to, to talk more oh, about no. uh, you know our initiative in Peru and specifically oh, no, this like beautiful uh, Art Impact initiative in Peru. Thank you. Well, I don't. Hi Pam, how are you? <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you for being here. Um, yes, my name is Diana Arquiaga, and I'm the program manager for Smile Train South America. I oversee all the Spanish-speaking countries the programs on the, in the Spanish-speaking countries in South America. So for us, we came further away. We just came from <laughs> Peru, Bogota, Madrid, Geneva, finally. So it was quite, quite a trip to be here. So basically, I guess, Pam, you already explained very well about Smile Train. I oversee, as I said, the programs. And for us, for me, it was a great challenge and a great honor when I was uh, chosen the director to manage this program, Art Impact for Health. Peru, basically, because there was this, there is this initiative between who Isabel and Smile Train to do this uh, project. So when I heard of this opportunity, then I remember my uh, partner, Dr. Antonio Segarra, who oversees one of our partners in Peru, Fundacion, Fundacion Margarita in Trujillo, which is a city 600 kilometers from uh, north of Lima. So I remember the first time I met Antonio a couple of years ago, actually his father is the founder of that foundation. Uh, when I first saw Antonio, he showed me, I walked into the clinic and there was the Marilyn, the Marilyn with a cleft Marilyn that he, there's over there being exhibited right now. So I was fascinated by it and he can later tell us a little bit about the story. But um, so I thought, hmm, I need to engage and an artist, I'm, I'm a psychologist, I manage the programs, but I, I can appreciate art, but I, I have no idea about how to do all of this beautiful work. So basically, Antonio was fundamental in putting this event together. Um, we work with, again, partnerships. We work with a lot of, um, first of all, was to find uh, the kind of mask we wanted uh, our artists to intervene. So I remember I visited, uh, I went with uh, Isabel to Morocco to see the over there, I recognize that to see some of the work that she was doing in Morocco to have an idea what to do in Peru. So I came back from Morocco very inspired. So I talked to Antonio. Antonio, this is what I saw. I sent him pictures of the Mac. So when he he contacted a, an architect who's also an artist, co creator, you will see a white mask. And we brought that one because this is the original model basically that we started we started to work with. So as to how to put this event together, because we wanted to bring the community, our partners, children with cleft, and that was the, and, and it, it was really an, a very nice work we put together with Antonio. It was this idea to have done, at first we did the masks and many Antonio's contact who knows very many of these uh, Peruvian artists, they started to intervene. Basically they donated the work just because they, um, like the idea to help and, and, and they understood the work because something that Pam maybe didn't mention, all our partners, when they receive funds from Small Train, they must treat the patients for free. So that's a condition. All, all the patients that we treat must be for free because the Small Train is providing the resources and not only for surgeries, as you will put it, but we provide comprehensive cleft care and that's what we focus on, speech, um, uh, surgery, well, not besides the surgery, speech, orthodontic, psychosocial, uh, nutrition. Now, now we're going, to, we're starting, and we're putting a lot of force in nutrition. So, basically, we provide all the, all of these comprehensive care services because we see the patients. Not only one, it's it's not only one thing. It's the continuum of the whole process because we want to fully rehabilitate a, a patient. So, basically, that job is how we put all together. We had a beautiful exhibition. Isabel came to Peru. We have a beautiful launch of the event. It was two days before the pandemic broke in Peru. So it was a madness, but it's a beautiful exhibition. And the following day we had a workshop with, I guess we had over how many patients? I guess like 30 maybe, 40 patients and their families. So it was a beautiful event. And the beautiful of this is that this event got all of us together. 
policymakers, teachers, community, doctors, patients. So it was a really nice opportunity to, to create more awareness and to, and, and to inspire the children and the families to work with us. So it was a really beautiful experience that we saw. Um, you could really see the impact of art, of being the children uh, and how the families engage and, and they started a conversation. We even had psychologists that came from our, another partner in Colombia. So I think this is, we were able to, to have the metrics of this experience and have a, there was a survey was developed. So I think this is something that we must do now. This is something that Pam and I eventually will be working with Isabel together in bringing art impact for health in other regions in uh, in our in with our partners. So I don't know. I think that's why we came all the way here to see the exhibition and to bring the everything has been a little bit of a challenge with this COVID times, but everything it's uh, now looking good. And thank you for having us here. Thank you, Elizabeth. For me, it's necessary to stay here and to look up because my words come from the, the children who was born with a cliff. I come from the north of Peru and a city named Trujillo. And there, there grew up a, a pre-Hispanic civilization, Los Moche. And, and, this, and this time, when a, ch a child was born with a cliff, he was treated like a god, and he was come the doctor and the chaman of the of the of the town. But now it's different because with a mother who had a children, we was born with this deformation. Uh, she hid, she hid, uh, and somebody she want to kill. I, I listen to that stories. Um, I see all my life the children with Cliff behind the eyes of my father. My father is a plastic surgery to return the smile to 100, more than 100 children. And, and the surgery is, is not enough. They need more. They need orthodoxy, they need therapy to talk, but it's enough yet because the soul is broken, and there is where the art come. And in, in March, I met Isabel, and we made an experience, yes, with the mask, and it was fantastic to, to give a children a mask with a cliff, and he recognized he had an identification, and he, and he painted. And um, for the stimulation, we invited 21 artists from, um, it was a fantastic, este, was a fantastic experience because uh, the, the children connect with some, something special like a meditation and he forgot all the past, but it's necessary to make this frequently. Look at the, the flag of the church, the Catholic church. Maybe they can do something special because in the towns, in the poor town in my country, the church is the first place where, where the family goes with we have problems. Um, well, this is all. Maybe the, the art must to be, como se dice? Um, prescribed by anything besides. Thank you.
Okay, I will take the floor for for François, and it's um yeah it's it's very uh, pity he cannot be uh, with us, but sometimes you know you have some storm, you have some tsunami, you have some any any anything can happen. Okay, will uh, just read from my uh, my mobile phone. And in the meantime, the musician will prepare themselves. From François Mabille, I would like, I would like first of all, like to greet the authorities present at the moment and thank the organizer for inviting me to express my perception of the issue that we'll be dealing with. I speak as a Secretary General of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. This federation was created in 1924 in the wake of what is called the spirit of Geneva, that it is to say the conviction and the hope of creating an international society based on equality of people, of states, on human rights and the firm conviction that international cooperation was the only possible way for a shared future. This hope is also the one that brings you together today at this time when the coronavirus crisis shows more than ever how necessary and useful the international institution which you represent are. The International Federation of Catholic Universities naturally articulates its activities with the objective of sustainable development. Allow me to underline two major orientations that are ours, our universities as organizations ensure their social responsibility. This is why we have created a specific framework for the social responsibility of universities, the academic Laudato C benchmark, which aims to raise awareness among our members with regard to the impact of their activity and their responsibility in the fields of poverty, gender equality, the use and promotion of clean energy, green campus, and of course, the fight against climate, climatic change. These teams are of course also found, second axis, in a large range of courses and in the creation of masters and specific university trainings. The objectives of sustainable development are therefore integrated into our universities, just as we try to ensure that the spirit of Francis Encyclical, Laudato Si, and the most recent Fratelli Tutti are also at the heart of our university practices. But as you know, contrary to what Austin wrote, to say is not to do, and so the question arises here of the transformation of our societies and the importance of leadership. The major characteristic of our societies, both internally and internationally, is that of risk. We live in a time of disruption in VUCA world. What kind of leadership do we need? We need leaders who consist on our belonging to a common 
humanity facing common challenges. Over the past two decades, theories of leadership have dramatically evolved as leaders respond to the challenge of today's rapidly changing global context. It becomes increasingly clear that there are still several gaps between traditional leadership approach and the approach that are needed for the future. Bill George, 2007, XXI5, author of The True North, Discover your authentic leadership notes that an enormous vacuum in leadership exists today in business, politics, government, education, religion, and non-profit organization. Fortunately, leadership theory has recently evolved beyond the traditional idea of a leader, and one such example is George's notion of authentic leadership. He argues that leaders are complex individuals who draw on their own distinctive qualities and unique life story to frame their leadership through their passions and purpose. Authentic and conscientious leaders are those who go beyond simply inspiring to surround them. They actively empower others to step up and lead. They are less focused on achieving their own leadership goal and more focused on drawing on their life experiences, passions, and purpose to unit the individuals and in their organization around a shared purpose. What truly set this type of leader apart is a commitment to enabling those around them to become leaders in their own context. A consciousness leader can be defined by the following four leadership dimensions. Pursuing purpose with passion, practicing solid value, leading with art, establishing enduring relationship. For that, what type of knowledge are needed? Here, knowledge refers to an understanding of internal and external factors that influence activity. Being aware of these factors is a necessity for a consciousness leader who wants to have a high impact. Of course, the knowledge of global challenge and dilemma articulate around the sustainable goal is one of the most important. It includes social and ecological pressure, such as globalization, climate change, and wealth inequality. That is to say, understanding how climate change and other environmental issues may, may affect business operation or even present opportunities to take social action. But the leader style is also important. Leadership style refers to the way a leader provides direction or motivates the team member to implement a plan. A consciousness leader will be able to vary their style of leadership as the context requires, often drawing on a combination of several styles. He must be inclusive, creative, and also altruistic. Collaborative and participative, building commitments through dialogue and consensus, democratic approach and coaching, as well as culture and structure that provides peer support and encouragement. This style recognizes achievement. Playing the role of designer, architect, innovator, game changer, and transformer of the system, this type of leader is innovative and good at visualizing the future. This style involves transcending self-interest and focusing on the collective or the good of the whole, which is often characterized as a servant leadership. In conclusion, a high-impact leader is someone who is self-aware and able to use their personal qualities for growth. This requires a certain courage and willingness to go against the grain and sketch a powerful alternative vision. The crucial quality of such a leader is an ability to see the whole system and navigate through complex terrain, while also showing an awareness of other people's perspective. This involves being able to think long-term and see the big picture. 
in summary of the tray and skill, action and knowledge required to develop a high impact style of leadership, we can consider these key characteristics of high impact leader, systemic understanding, emotional intelligence, value orientation, compelling vision, inclusive style, innovative approach, and finally, the long-term perspective. Thank you so much for François Mabille, and thank you to all of you. And we will, uh, we will clôture this extraordinary inauguration with all of you guests with, uh, with music. We have started uh, this panel with Beethoven. Mm -hmm.